Hi, everyone. It's Simran Sandu. And it's your boy, Michael Sakan, bringing you episode three of Our Future Podcast, the number one business podcast for young people. Speaking of young people, me and Simi are pretty young. <laughs> we sold our first company. I was 22. He was a little older at the ripe old age of 23. And we exited to a major media company who's now given us the opportunity to do a podcast where we study the best and brightest young entrepreneurs and we share their tactics and their strategies so you can steal them and apply them to your own business. It's a lot more productive to learn from your peers who are building and being smart about business than it is to look at people who have already built billion dollar companies. So that's the thesis behind our show. And Michael, I'll tell you why I'm so excited for today. Not only are we going to study other entrepreneurs' ideas, but you and I are gonna riff on a few new ideas that an aspiring entrepreneur can take and run with. Go ahead and tell us about our first up-and-coming billionaire for today's episode. Definitely a future billionaire. Today, I have Akshaya Dinesh. So Akshaya was a Stanford student specializing in AI, computer science, whiz kid, by all means. Uh, she's a Teal Fellow. Her first company was a professional networking platform for Gen Z called Ladder. It was a community helping connect students to jobs, opportunities, internships, startups, what have you. Uh, that company was later acquired by Handshake, though she left uh, a few years before that business exited. And she started building a company called Spellbound. And Akshaya has revolutionized email marketing by bringing interactivity to emails. For the longest time, emails were this one-to-many marketing approach, right? where you would just project to as many subscribers as you possibly could, they would look at your email, and then to access any more information or to have to be a part of the user experience, you have to click on links and then click away from the site to participate in any kind of extra functionality, whether it's filling out a review for a product or purchasing your next order from that company or maybe uh, recovering a cart that you've been shopping with. Akshaya has brought that all inside email. Look, I don't think anyone would debate. Akshaya is incredibly intelligent. But what stands out to me about her is she's effectively taking emerging technology and applied it to old traditional industries. I think a lot of people have thought about building an alternative to LinkedIn, but she was able to use this AI machine learning background that she had. Now she has email in her lens because what she's effectively done is created such a technologically advanced product that not only has she changed the entire rules of the game, but the product sells itself. You can go yeah. to a brand and show them such an interactive experience that they can be like, wow, like not only are you incredibly talented, but I would take a chance on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's also made the moat 100 feet deep because <laughs> none of these other companies are primed to develop the tech that she's doing, right? If you're building a newsletter platform, let's look at Beehive and Substack, one-stop shop MailChimp competitor. But what Akshaya has done is operates in a very specific layer of the email newsletter process, right? Creating tools and features inside the email itself. So she's not doing all the formatting. She's not doing all that, that stuff, that wide reaching platform. She's building for a very specific kind of use case to drive more users to companies and to help people get more conversions. And how does she drive this revenue and engagement? It comes from the whole reducing friction because yeah. what would happen is you would see all of these links in a newsletter and it would take you off page. So the idea on paper is that the entire shopping experience would be conducted in the email insane. itself. How insane right? is that though? Like these investors were just like, holy crap. Like, I think that's what Akshaya always wanted because exactly. uh, the company she was building with Ladder, the product didn't sell itself, right? It was more of the value of the community and you had to get the critical mass to make a professional networker or consumer social app work. Her big issue was, so Ladder's early inception was they were doing an email newsletter. They would scrape the web for remote internships. Then they would use LinkedIn to be the distribution hub. They'd say, comment your email if you want access to all the top remote internships or companies that are hiring college students right now. Again, this is after the pandemic. Nobody had a job. People would comment their email and then they would use AI and just like scrape all the emails off of LinkedIn. They'd fill their newsletter. And then Akshaya was talking about how people would just have to click a link and leave the newsletter. She's like, no, this should all be going to a platform. It should all be in endemic. It should all be one and the same. And her big issue was retention with any consumer social app. It's how do you get people coming back? And with what Akshaya has done now, she's taken the idea of retention to a new level. Yeah, and I also think what separates her is that when you create a technologically advanced product, you effectively get to define all of the rules in the space. 
And so typically, how would you measure the success of an email? You may look through click-through rate. You may look at engagement. LTV. LTV. In a lot of these commerce-based newsletters, you may also look at some kind of transaction value. But because the product is so different, you get to define how you view engagement, right? Did you notice the approach she took was very different, though? I mean, she's virtually had very little PR for this. She's been very... Quiet. Silent hums the word with this company. I also think this whole building in public thing is not a great idea. That might be my hot take, but she may be a different case because there's a lot of defensibility here. But if you're in these commoditized industries where your only advantage is pricing power, yeah. why would you give up all your secrets and insights for everybody to yeah. come take? It makes <laughs> she no in, sense. She was in stealth for a while. Uh, yeah. Everyone's like, build in public, build in public. <laughs> it's like, bro, like I can see what you're doing. That's how all these D2C companies get screwed, by the way. Yeah. Is that really what happens? Well, they're very broad. Right? You have to do a lot of marketing in the first yeah, place. Yeah, but like a lot of these like Shopify-based apps and stuff. I've seen like you come out with a new Shopify app and there's like 10 different ones like yeah. within the next few months, right? It's it's really hard. You should keep a lot of your secrets to yourself. There's no advantage in, in sharing these playbooks. Well, she has virtually no competition. I think she's yeah. actually prepared herself for an acquisition very nicely. I think a MailChimp, a Beehive, a Substack could definitely come in and acquire her company and kind of bring this interactivity to all the clients which use their their newsletter, right? Like they could own the feature pretty much. Well, the or they could keep licensing it out how, it, how it's been done. But do you see Akshaya's uh, potential acquisition as more of a, we're going to keep this feature all to ourselves, or we're going to let people continue to transact even outside of our ecosystem with this product? I think they keep it to themselves. I think there's more brand value and equity in doing it that way. Yeah. But the big question mark is, does this product work and scale in the long term? Because she's showing these brands all the bells and whistles, all the really cool things that can happen by using Spellbound, but does it actually work? Does it actually convert? And I think if you take Feastables, that is a very curiosity-driven product, right? Yeah. It's very vibrant colors. It's attached to a big name. So if you're probably looking at a product like that, yeah. there's a good chance you already had planned on buying, right? right? If you're actively seeking out Feastables or you're subscribed to their newsletter, will that work for more cookie cutter, not as cool, not as viral yeah, driven I want to see Kohl's on this bitch. <laughs> I want to see like Macy's using this. If well, Macy's you're going to need this, those big enterprise customers, you do, right? You do. Again, how many of the F Fortune 2000 can, can use your product? Right. Yeah. It, it's a non-starter as to why Mr. Beast's team would want to screw around with like something unique and interesting and like make a Twitter about it. But like, is there staying power? I think the tech is is certainly a challenge. I think another challenge is uh, she's built this to be a software platform. Like you can fully do it on your own, set up your own campaigns. But there's a ton of education that needs to take place for how people can op, you know, optimize campaigns. And a lot of the work they've done so far has been very intimate with their brand partners. It's like, we're going to build you a bespoke game. Right, right. We're going to build you a bespoke uh, shopping cart look, look, layout experience, right? So I think there's challenges there. I will say that one growth hack, I think actually has done a good job with, with branding, even though she hasn't done a lot of PR, is that she found that a lot of the people who are reading these e-commerce newsletters are actually the competitors of the other D2C companies. <laughs> <laughs> so they're looking at their newsletters and kind of judging their value based on how good their newsletter is because they're also trying to sell a newsletter, right? And she puts the Spellbound logo on the kind of interactive pop-ups and kind of like squares that are built into the code. And that has driven a lot of kind of organic discovery for her and has yeah, allowed what a her to add more clients. Tool too, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's no better way to get business than playing two competitors against each other. Actually, I was doing a little like more chill and like unintentionally. But I remember in the early days of our future when I was trying to get brand deals, I would go to one company and be like, hey, I'm talking to your competitor. Um, they're offering X amount of money. Um, you know, I'm kind of closing my inventory for the month. Would you want to jump in with me? And then I go to the other company, which I hadn't talked to before. And I'd be like, hey, your competitor wants to pay me X much. And I play them off each other and I ended up working with both. Right. Yeah. And, and something I think you have to be careful about is if these brands are talking to one another, you don't want to be selling them on very different stories because it could end up backfiring. But something I want to also talk about is how intentional she was with how she built her team this time around. When she was with Ladder, they had raised a lot more money. They were hiring quite a bit. 
more team members, but with this one, Akshaya told us that they have been very lean and she has only hired experts on every single part of the value chain. So mm-hmm. she's found the best product people, she's found the best growth people, she has found the best tech back end people, and now she's building the super team because that's what you have to do if you're trying to build something that is so different from everything else in the market. Yeah, that guy Brian Blum who came to our networking event works for her, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cool dude. What does he do? He, email marketing? He's a part of the growth team, yeah. Part of the growth team? Yeah, I think uh, if I've ever heard a story of a second-time founder, it's that, right? Like, no wonder it's easier for second-time founders to raise money. Like, they've already made the hiring mistakes. They've already made the, the growth mistakes and the uh, the capital expenditure mistakes, right? So Akshay has really positioned herself for, for another win. What's the big takeaway from a business sense of Akshay's company Spellbound? Here's what I think it is. It's you find a medium and you bring more interactivity, more data points, more engagement, and you just spruce it up, you know, and build within that communication channel. So take all these ideas with a grain of salt. It's not like we spent, (laughs) you know, years researching them and building a business plan for them. But I think there is an opportunity in the audio podcast space and that it's very one way. It was just like how email was, like you consume a podcast very passively in audio and there just aren't many features to signal if you enjoyed a certain episode. Like there just isn't that tooling available. So if someone can build some way for audio podcast listeners to be recognized or integrate with Shopify or Apple's API to be like, this person wrote a review and they have listened to my podcast X many times. The challenge is these these companies like Spotify and Apple don't want to give up the data. Yeah, they're gatekeepers, right? They're They're not just going to hand it over. But like, yeah, I think sometimes you just have to be like, screw it. I'm just going to go after the gatekeeper and, and like force them to change. Do you think you could actually scrape this data though? Ah, there might be some way to do it. I, I Again, it takes an inventive entrepreneur like Akshaya who has a lot of technical talent to be able to do it. But I know if someone could create a alternative to Morning Brew's referral system, like, if you can, like the way the email newsletters have scaled through referrals, if podcasts could do the same, where I'm rewarded for sending to John because John consumed five minutes of our future podcast. Like if I could get that data, I could... I could then reward my greatest fans. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of value in helping building out these growth tools, yeah. right? Because it's just so hard to grow audio podcasts. And if you're first to market and have a decent product, you could probably capture most, if not all, of the market share just because it's going to take time for people to get up and compete with you. Yeah, and it's never been done before. Just exactly. Like Akshay has done. Yeah. Um, kind of a moonshot idea, but like mail, like – I noticed that my mom and like at our house, we still get tons of mail. Yeah, same here. From fashion companies yeah. and all sorts of businesses that have somehow garnered your address, right? But like, you know, we just grab the mail and we we still, people still intentionally sort through their mail stack looking for important documents from perhaps the IRS or for their credit card statement or whatever. But there's so much junk in there. Like imagine if you just did it like a little better. Like <laughs> I've heard of this uh, AI company that like essentially it's like a robot and it will write letters like, and it looks like it's handwritten, right? So like that's like one idea of how like technology could be used to like personalize content out to all these different people like if you could just do like be a little bit better than the rest of people that they're sending mail order well even the packaging right if you can find a way to create packaging that's very optimized and conducive to the product itself that could probably do great like if you're selling perfume or if you're selling literally any product i feel like sms is a big opportunity because that's also a very one-way route right now and it's also being celebrated as like the other alternative to owning your audience like email I remember this great business story of this guy, uh, Vitaly Zlotsky, who built Game Pigeon. And he wanted to go to bat with like the big game developers like Zynga and Niantic. And he saw Apple had made an update that allowed you to build games within iMessage. So he built the the pool game, right? And he he did like all those little like mini games. And he was able to integrate like really natural into the iOS system. Like if brands could do that, I think that could be interesting, right? Because like what Akshay is doing is increasing engagement through games and allowing people to give feedback, Right. I don't know if a lot of people end up texting back to those promotional numbers that text them. Look, I know SMS is an incredible engagement tool. So it's a great way to reach people. I think the yeah. challenge with SMS has been it's really hard to monetize around it. So that's probably one thing you'd have to think about, too. Yeah. I mean, you can't really put as many links. Like, it's just not as conducive to a purchase as, as It email. also feels very spammy. Yeah. And how many people, I don't know if many people make a purchase. People make more purchases on desktop for sure. 
Also, the, also another aspect is the phishing side of it, right? Like you see all of these scams, like on at least email, it gets filtered to junk. That doesn't happen on text. Like they're getting so many people, especially all these grandmas, right? It's like your FedEx order has been delivered. Click this link. And so that's something yeah. else too. Um, <laughs> you know, I think another incredible entrepreneur who has been able to build something creative and unique and has built up quite a bit of market share for themselves is our friend Zach over at Foreplay. Yeah, so Zach is 27 years old. Uh, he's built a business that's doing millions of dollars in revenue per year, and it's fully bootstrapped. So Zach's story goes back to a lot of young entrepreneurs. I don't want to beat this over the head, but he did start with an agency, and we talked a lot about how agencies are great for his businesses. Uh, and he ended up doing a, a drop shipping business as well, doing micro-made plant hangers. <laughs> <laughs> like He was like, yeah, like a bunch of hippie girls bought him. <laughs> What people should know is that any e-commerce product that's being consumed by a ton of like young hippie girls is probably made by some straight white guy in Arizona, like just running the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, D2C is also one in these highly niche categories, yeah. right? With a very passionate audience. Bro, like see some like kind of like shifty, like entrepreneurial kid. And I'll be like, <laughs> Yo, like, like, what is your business? You're in D2C. He's like, yeah, I sell yoga pants. Yeah. So Zach ended up doing also an agency for like performance creative. So performance creative is when you design an advertisement that's meant to have like spend behind it on Facebook uh, or TikTok. And he ends up being like, I am made to be a lone wolf. He's like meditating in Mexico. And he's like, I don't need a co-founder. I'm going to go my own way. I want to build things. So he starts foreplay with foreplay. You look at other advertisements being run by other companies on Facebook or TikTok, and using their Chrome extension, you can one-click save. Now, the challenge and the problem that Zach identified was when marketers are looking at their competition and how they're advertising, often the ad will disappear. So say you have a competitor that's clearly running up numbers with this ad, they're having a creator talk about their product in a certain way, boom, it'll disappear in 24 hours. So he allows you to permanently save ads. But what Zach has been able to do is create this mechanic where it all stays evergreen. And then that was like the, the problem that he was going after. Yeah, I think it makes a ton of sense, right? Like you don't want your competitors to know what ads are most effective because they'll yeah. just rip you off. Yeah. Um, but I think one thing that's interesting is just owning the supply of data, right? Like Facebook had all of this data and when the ad disappeared, you're kind of shit out of luck. Zach was able to curate all of these insights and all of this data and effectively enable a search function to it. So you could go to foreplay and find all of these ads that were um, relative to what you were looking for. And now you were able to use this for inspiration. And I thought this was a very ingenious product. And I think this business is doing several millions of dollars, if yeah. not more, right? He's in Hampton with yeah. Sam. Yeah. He was at my birthday party, so I knew he had some <laughs> he had some sauce. Like he he is doing consistent revenue with this business. What I find most interesting about foreplay is the data that like Zach is generating. Like you were talking about this, right? Like he's essentially creating a library of like all the best ads that have ever been deployed, right? Because he's got all these marketing teams. He has like over 1,500 enterprises using this. And they have their best people picking the ads that they find most interesting. And now he has this library. So he's created like all these like tertiary and ancillary businesses outside of the inspiration portion, right? So Foreplay started as being the place you go to come up with your next video ad idea. And the reason Foreplay came at a great time is that video content is now like the status quo for creating ads. It's no longer just static Instagram ads. Uh, it's no longer just like programmatic Facebook. Like it's like you need to come up with great organic content and then put spend behind it. So video is complex and the creative behind videos is hard, right? Because there's so much that goes into it. So Zach came at a time where it can almost be like your fractional creative strategist, be the first place that you start your journey of creating an ad. But now he's created other things, right? Where you can get access to what everyone else is looking at, right? You can search ads inside Foreplay's library. You can uh, collaborate with team members. It's like Google Docs for marketing. Collaborate with team members. Um, you can use AI to generate a brief or generate an ad for you based on someone else's ad. So it really has evolved into so much more. Yeah, and I also think that it's segmented between agencies and brands. And this is almost a hybrid solution that yeah. both segments can use and, and utilize effectively. It's like if you own the first step of any process, like you're in position to control the rest, right? If you think of like um, Rockefeller, while well, he didn't uh, actually pump oil out of the ground, he was the refiner. But after that, he would then go and ship oil across the railroads, right? He would put it in pipes. He would build these, these pipelines. Like he would then uh, sell the byproducts and create kerosene lamps and all these sorts of other things. So 
by taking the first step of the process of making something a reality, you're able to then control the other elements of it, right? So he's catching marketers at their like earliest phase of like, I am in this creative zone. I need to be in this place, right? Yeah. And and now I, I'm going to go from here. Find your entry point and then grow. But most importantly, I think in this specific point in time in the marketing category, whatever you're building has to be able to either do one of two things. You have to be able to drive revenue or you have to be able to cut costs. In very upbeat macro environments where people were spending a lot of money, cash was abundant, you can really approach people with this whole brand awareness play. But in times like these, that does not work. If there's not a quantitative number where you can show ROI based off of the product that you've built, then you're gonna have a lot of challenges trying to sell that unless you have an incredible brand name, you have some distribution strategy that makes you so so much more competitive than, competitive than everybody else. So I would push everyone who's building in this category to think about that first. How can you drive revenue or how can you cut costs? Yeah, I also think what's interesting is he's in playing on that innate desire for people to look at what their competition is doing, right? Like Jeff Bezos, it's funny because Zach... Uh, quotes Jeff Bezos. He's like, if you're looking at your competition, then you're not caring about your customer. But everyone who's using his product is caring about their competition. So I think if you can target that FOMO of like, what is my competitor doing? I need this tool to make sure I always have a wrap on them. I need to be like their ad creative personal investigator, right? And he he's he's like targeted that psychology of marketers to like ne- always want to be ahead of things and see what's going on. So I think that he's he's built a product that is really fortuitous for marketers specifically and how they operate. And the great thing is, is that over time, this product is only going to get better because it's a data driven product. Right. And so as more ads are, are brought into the, the platform, as more data is collective, it's going to get even smarter. And then he can go create all of these products and services throughout that. I see so many different upsells for him. Like, it's truly an ingenious product. His dream is to get acquired by Adobe. Yeah. I think it can happen. I think it could. I mean, it feels very Canva-like when I look at this plan. It's beautiful. Board. Yeah. I love what he said about calling his company Foreplay, right? Yes, yes. Like the reason he called it Foreplay was because he read Richard Branson's biography, which I actually just read. So Branson called his company Virgin at the time that was so taboo, right? Calling your company after like a sexual term, right? But it ended up being the biggest bargaining point for his brand because it's all about fun, right? Like be a little edgy. And what I think is interesting about Zach is he spent some time working at Triple Whale as a designer while he was working on his product. And Triple Whale has always uh, exemplified that a B2B SaaS company doesn't need to be boring, right? They can have a lot of social media. They can have a voice, right? So I think that's also cool. He's very product-focused, beautiful design, but he's also made his company like a little controversial, a little more interesting to people. Yeah, another thing that Zach was telling us is like, I know a lot of people who want to build in software because it's so scalable, Right. And like it is that thing that investors love and it's that sexy industry. But Zach was being like, don't be married to the software, like be married to the problem. He also made a really good point in that to get an A engineer, sometimes you have to start with the C engineer is like never build for a perfect UI when you're starting a software company because it doesn't matter. Like if you're solving a problem, people will use the software. It might be a little clunky. It may not look perfect, but like people will be using it. Mm. And then when you bring on your, an engineer who's like, oh my God, there's people using this. I'm working on something that people actually care about. The, the product can get so much better because you have a technical person that's so bought in. Yeah, and I think you have to think about the constraints too. For Zach, he bootstrapped this business, so Mm -hmm. it's not like he was flush with cash. But I also like his approach on hiring because what he says is find out that one thing you're good at and double down. So if you're the designer, be the best designer that you can be. Don't focus on sales. Don't focus on ops. And find other people who can fill in those gaps for you. And we've talked about that in previous episodes, but that shows here, I think. And I think he's one of those people where design is something he truly prides. And I think that's why this product has been able to be so different and so distinct is because he micromanages every single little detail that you see on this platform. He's very jobs in that way. He's very obsessed. But I do also want to bring up another point, and it's about his triple whale experience. We talked about in the last episode how when you work at a big company, you notice a lot of their problems. And then you can go build a solution out of that that can become a really big company. Another really important thing about working at a company like this, you're getting exposed to a lot of key stakeholders. You're essentially behind the scenes and you get exposed to who the buyers are in this space, what they really care about. 
Um, you get to facilitate and build these relationships. So when you do create that product or service, now you have five or six people you can call up immediately to go sell them on this, right? And boom, now you went from zero to 10K, 20K, 30K pretty quick. Yeah, he literally signed himself up for an internship while he's building his company. <laughs> uh, a couple of cool growth hacks from Zach. So Zach uh, made the foreplay saved ads, saved videos embeddable on other websites. So when journalists would write about like the this best performing ad campaign or like this ad is crushing it or the 10 best inspiration for your next big creative campaign, they would be able to embed for, uh, foreplay's videos into the website, into the article, right? And it was native, right? It was just kind of like what Akshaya putting her company's logo, you know, in the email, like he was also doing that and creating some brand there. And then he also did something interesting is that he didn't limit seats. So, you know, just to get adoption inside these companies, there was a lot of education he had to do and that this isn't typical channel management software. Like this isn't like Hootsuite. Like this is a, a creative platform where you start your kind of creative ideation. And he allows collaborators and didn't charge companies extra for like bringing people in to work with them on stuff, which I thought was also interesting because that enabled the product to grow faster. Yeah. And you need more people to use it and mm -hmm. learn it before you can focus on price. Right. And yeah. I thought his competitive philosophy was pretty interesting, which is the whole copycat versus actual competitor. He feels like he has no respect for copycats and it's almost like if he loses a client to a competitor in this case, he feels very much like they've taken something from him. Like yeah. it's like taken taking away of time, taking, taking time, his time, taking a part of his life, something yeah. from his life. And I thought that was kind of an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. That was really interesting. Just to see how intense he was about it. So this. intense. I think he does. I think he does do better as a solo, <laughs> co solo founder, bro. Well, one interesting <laughs> insight around this is I was talking to the former uh, CEO of AppSumo and his name's Eamon incredibly talented and he helped build AppSumo to I think a hundred million dollars a year in revenue. Um, and his philosophy on this is that unless you're trying to build a unicorn, you should be a solo founder. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. He thought that when you're playing with smaller mid-sized ideas, you're actually getting in, a, in each yes. other's way. Um, yeah, let's be I, real. Like yeah. for you and I, exit like was the only way that made sense once that we realized that we didn't kind of we had joined together, right? Like yeah, that's what but we, were we building wanted towards. to build a multi-billion dollar idea. Yeah. It was a big problem we wanted to yeah. solve. All right, a few business ideas based on what Zach did. So when I think about Zach's company, I think about like how can you create tooling that allows people to like better copy their competition or like leverage something innovative that someone else has done into their own like process. So mainly like creative focus, right? I'm kind of staying within that box. So the first idea I have is uh, who's sponsoring who? And I've actually seen someone do this in the newsletter space. They will aggregate like which companies are advertising on newsletters. So you can see like which companies are in the market. When you want to build an ads business, the first thing you need to do is figure out who is spending money with your competitor. Then once you do that, you underprice your competitor, you reach out to those brands, you get the deals, and then eventually you reach parity with your competitors. Like that's how you build an advertising business, whether you're a creator, newsletter writer, uh, it doesn't matter. That's how you start. So I think it could be cool if this was brought to other mediums like podcasting, TikTok, Instagram, right? If there was like this platform that was constantly keeping tabs on which brands are spending with who, because like that's billions of dollars per year, right? Being deployed on, on social media and on advertising, especially on these like different channels. Yeah, I think one thing that it would need to factor into is can it do it in real time? Because there's fluctuating priorities for a lot of these brands. And so knowing who is currently spending money is very, very important for this to be successful. Yeah. Especially in a market right like right now, right? Like yeah. brand deals are harder to get. So it's like who's left standing? Yeah. Like who's still deploying? Yeah. Like if he's deploying with like, you know, this huge influencer, they got money. Right. Totally. So I like businesses that create signals. And it's not necessarily like this money is being spent. We're tracking and tracing the paper trail. It's like this person is working with this person and therefore like you understand something about that business and then and then you can vet that person more heavily when you reach out to them. And to your point, you could find out which brands are spending the most money and go to their competitors and say, hey, this brand is spending a lot of money. So, you know, maybe this is something you should be thinking about too. Yeah. I think a, a foreplay for YouTube thumbnails, like I think you could just probably use foreplay for this. It's not, it's more designed for video, but yeah, we look at so many YouTube thumbnails and I don't know, maybe if you could just kind of, 
make a note to yourself, like, as, especially as we grow this podcast as a YouTube first show, I'm obsessed with thumbnails right now. Like, I've hired this outside designer, and I work really intimately with her on it, and I think we really crushed it for the Seamus episode. It got more views than the original, I think, because of the thumbnail. So, yeah, I think that would be awesome, because there's, we look at so many thumbnails, right? And just, like, really, like, selecting that top, like, 1%, and then creating templates out of that and allowing people to design based off that would be really cool. But at the end of the day, right, like more business ideas, like, I mean, anything creative, but also like, again, like everyone tries to take down the notes page, right? That's curation. It's like we find something that inspires us or something that's interesting to us and we drop it in our iOS notes. Yeah. The, and it never comes back again. Yep. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity when you think about it through the lens of find where there are testing grounds, like in this YouTube format, right? You want to do A-B testing. You want to figure out which one is optimized for X thing or Y thing. And I think anywhere where you have to test several different formats to come to one key optimized insight, there's probably an opportunity there to curate, you know, a lot of the media assets or a lot of the assets yeah. to create something compelling. I also think for like written, like if you could just like take passages from a book that really moved you and then yeah. put that in a repository of sorts or just build a, uh, a, a Pinterest board that is agnostic to data type. So I'm going to pull in MP4s. I'm going to pull in uh, text. I'm going to pull in web pages and then they're all going to exist in like in bubbles in this platform. I feel like that would be really cool. Like essentially a second brain, right? That's what four play is. It's a second brain, right? And like creatives. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to trust this thing, right? It loses a lot of what it brings in. So I, I like the idea of just creating this kind of like treasure trove for people to like go back and, and return to. And I think it would make people better content creators. Totally. Right? Especially well, if you take stuff yeah. you see on Twitter and like you're like, oh, okay, let me just put my own spit on that. Yeah, the issue with a lot of these inspiration-focused ideas, though, is people don't really just use it for inspiration. They just copy and paste the entire thing and yeah. expect it to yield the same results. Yeah, people just be copying everyone these <laughs> no, days. No one wants to do the work. Yeah, <laughs> people have gotten less original over time, but maybe people have always been that way. Well, that's something really cool about this, right? Because you see a lot of these AI-based tools, and it's like, oh, they're going to take over. Reality is, is that creativity is more valued than ever because that's something a lot a lot of these ai tools can't make up for is those people who are truly creative have an advantage well hopefully our jobs are safe then hopefully <laughs> uh everyone thank you for listening to our future podcast episode three leave us a review on apple podcasts or spotify if you love the show if you're on audio we love those YouTube. five stars yeah we love the five stars but what we like even more is a youtube comment let us know what we can do better stories you want us to cover um, like it, give us that subscription. We're going YouTube first for this show, very visually focused. And send over some ideas. If you think you're a good fit to be featured on the show, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, our Twitter handles are in the description of the episode. So just hit our line and let us know who we should cover. I love today's stories, like Akshay and, and Zach, very marketing focused. I love marketing tech. Um, so I feel like there was a nice time between both stories and we got them done quickly. Yeah, we're trying to switch it up too, though. Other industries soon to come. All right, everybody. Stay frosty. We'll be with you soon. All right. Stay frosty. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.